If you master the basic cooking techniques, you can build your confidence, cooking skills, and repertoire. Cooking is so easy once you understand the basics. And there's no better teacher than legendary Michelin-starred chef Raymond Blanc. I feel like Picasso. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to share what he's learned in his professional kitchen. What is my reaction? Gives flavor, color, and taste to the food. To help you achieve incredible results at home. That's kind of dish you will remember all of your life. Raymond will reveal the secrets behind the simple techniques at the heart of every dish. If you go too high, you burn it. If you go too slow, nothing happens and goes beige, like English cuisine 40 years ago. From baking to roasting, poaching to frying, barbecuing and slow cooking. Oh la la, oh la la, and I mean oh la la. And all in his own unique way. De dormir avec toi. <laughs> Raymond Blanc taught himself to cook. Now he will teach you. What I promise to give you is a deep understanding of what's happening in your saucepan, in your oven. And these techniques will help you become a better cook. I think slow cooking is such an important technique. This is what it does, is make very tough working muscles and fibrous ingredients completely meltingly delicious. Slow cooking is a simple culinary method from humble roots. But when mastered, it has miraculous results on a range of ingredients from garden crops to meat and even seafood. It works beautifully with vegetables, especially chewy, woody ones. And they're a great place to start getting to grips with this versatile technique. You can take any vegetables you want to, whether it is carrots, parsnips, turnips, onions, garlic, caramelize them, brown them, and slow cook them at 120 degree temperature. Today I have artichoke. What I'm going to do is to just take the heart. All what I'm interested in is just the heart. That's what I'm interested in. Voila, a bit of lemon juice. A squeeze of lemon stops the artichoke discoloring. Next, chop red onion, fennel, and chicory. Okay, and I've got my garlic that Adam has very kindly peeled for me this morning. God, I love him. I love the man. <laughs> Years ago, that garlic was despised, was feared. Oh my God, I want to taste of garlic. Now everyone tastes of garlic. Before they're slow cooked, the garlic and vegetables are brown to extract the sugars and intensify the flavors. Temperature is everything. If you go too high, you burn it. If you go too slow, it's just no, go on. no, it just nothing happens and goes beige, like English cuisine 40 years ago. That's better. Voilà. And already there's a beautiful browning process going on because there's so much sugar in garlic. Nobody knows that, but there's so much sugar. That's why caramelized brown very, very fast. Okay, I put my vegetables. Now the herbs. Rosemary, bay leaf, sage, a little bit of thyme, not too much, huh? be careful. You'll be surprised how this little fellow here can completely overtake the other flavors. So it's balanced, remember? Taste it, smell it. Break it between your hands. All the essential oils are oozing out. And then you understand, oh my God, that little fellow has got character, a lot of character. Let's be careful. A splash of balsamic vinegar then adding water will create a braising stock to steam the vegetables and keep them moist while they're slow cooking in the oven. Make sure you place the pan on the lower shelf, because if you put it on the very top, the heat will reflect on the vegetables and burn them and overcook them. Good tip. An hour and a half of slow cooking at 120 degrees will evaporate the water leaving the vegetables coated in a rich, silky glaze. Lovely, beautiful colors. Very rich, very simple. So taste, of course, your beloved garlic. Vive la France. Oh. A little bit of a rabou au ham. Delicious. A bit of olive oil. The balsamic vinegar, a bit of seeds, and my sage deep fried. 
Et là, juste pour finir, parmesan. Voilà. Beautiful. The same slow cooking technique used for vegetables can be surprisingly effective for ingredients usually cooked quickly. It's still one pot cooking, but not one step cooking. And it's vital to get each stage right for a good result. This next recipe reveals how to slow cook perfectly tender squid with smoky chorizo and a hearty tomato stew. The best way to cook a squid is either one minute or one hour, nothing in between. Otherwise, it will be completely inedible. The squid has got a very big flavor that you actually don't see when you flash fry it. You only see it and taste it when you slow cook it. But it's not just the flavor that's enhanced. Slow cooking also improves the texture of the squid. The tough collagen in the muscle fibers are broken down, leaving the cooked flesh succulent and buttery. Okay, so first, what we're going to do is to pull the skin off. Put a bit of salt in your hands, that does help, so you can grab the skin better. Très bien. Going to open it up. That is pine. Look at that. This beautiful plume. I think I'll keep it. Who is the chief here? Okay, here. You know who it is, okay? So I'm going to score it now. The whole idea is for the marinade to permeate beautifully right through the flesh and also tenderizing it as well. First, make the tomato stew the squid will slow cook in. Chop garlic and onion and fry off in extra virgin olive oil. Add thyme and a couple of bay leaves. Then we're going to put a nice small paprika to give it a lovely smoky flavor. Oh, that looks so lovely. Okay, so now I've got my tomatoes. Just slice it in big chunks. I can smell my onions, okay? I can hear it as well, what's happening behind. That takes a bit of experience. 40, actually. <laughs> no, not that long, is it? Oh, time passed away. Voilà. So now I'm going to add my tomato puree. Okay, très bien. So my tomatoes in. Oh, it's so simple. Anyone can do it in their home. I'm going to bring a bit of acidity. Of course, you think about lemon juice, but mostly one is the best. Boil off some of the alcohol to get rid of the harshness. If you don't boil it down, it will spoil your dish. Of course, taste, taste, taste. But one now is perfect. Well, that's good, yeah? My chorizo. That lovely smoky flavor, which will go so well with that squid. And you'll see the miracle of the slow cooking. How it makes those two totally strange flavors come together and love each other completely. So we have my potatoes here. And then the squid. And it just simply makes all these amazing flavors. This slow cooking not only allows the flavors come through, it invites them, it helps them to penetrate each other's, to give to each other, to create something extraordinary, both in terms of taste and textures. So no boiling, just one gentle little bubble, maybe in one corner, set two, well, not two, you would spoil it, just one, barely pop, pop. One hour, not one minute more, one hour. To add a contrasting texture, flash frying scored squid for one minute gives this dish the very best of two techniques, frying and slow cooking. That's it, okay, that's about one minute maximum. Look how beautiful it is, barely cooked, transparent, but very little flavor. The flavor would be the slow cooked dish. After an hour on the stove, the slow-cooked squid in the stew will be beautifully tender. Plate it very nicely with lots of love. The rest for the cook, all well. Voila. Mm. The heat has broken down all the collagen, the textures, into soft, gentle, tasty, delicious flavors. The chorizo has taken the squid flavor a little bit. The tomatoes have taken both flavors. The potatoes have decided 
to remain potato. Completely. Why? I don't know. I don't know everything. <laughs> Raymond relies on great ingredients for his kitchen at Le Manoir, but best doesn't have to mean the most expensive. He's traveling to London to find out about little known and cheaper cuts of meat, which are perfect for slow cooking. Nathan Mills is a third generation butcher. Meat has been in his family for over a hundred years. Not very sexy, is it? These things. You want me to straighten right. your collar up? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, put it in. What a mess here. Yeah. Most butchers will buy and sell only prime cuts of meat, but Nathan is passionate about making use of the whole animal. He only buys pedigree rare breeds. Am I going to die here? It depends if we get out before <laughs> dark or not. <laughs> wow, God, that's a pretty good stock you have. The cold room holds up to 20 carcasses, which can hang there for up to 60 days. I'm the only butcher that does whole carcass butchery in London that I know of. Hanging and aging meat tenderizes it, so the tougher cuts, normally discarded, become succulent when slow cooked. So this here is yeah. our forequarter. Yeah. So it's the front shoulders, the animal. Yeah. And I will do a shin, just yeah. slow cooked. Yeah, a whole shin? Yeah. The yeah. whole one. Very good. So let's get an aged one yeah, out, yeah, put yeah. it on the block okay, and do some yeah. butchery. OK. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lovely piece. So I've brought out a little Dexter. Yeah. Small beef, huh? Small, it is. It's a very small. Yeah, it's Dexter's. It's not much bigger than me. <laughs> no, it's not. This Dexter cow is the smallest breed native to the UK. Its compact size gives intensity to the meat's flavor. I'm going to show you what mm -hmm. I think is quite a cheeky little cut for myself. Cheeky? Yeah, mm -hmm. well, I call it cheeky, cheeky, cheeky yeah, butcher's cheeky, cuts. Cheeky. Yeah. You should come more often. You can hold all my oh, meat. No. Fantastic. I've never seen it cut that way. OK. No cross like that. So we can see now. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. You can see the, that marbling through there that's just going to melt down as we slow cook it. So I'll keep it for me later. I just call them beef ribs. OK. OK. They do. Nathan's nose-to-tail ethos means that nothing goes to waste. The Dexter cow's forequarter gives him a third more cut of meat than the average high street butcher. Chin of beef is a great cut. Well, I mean, people rave on about veal osso buccal yeah, yeah, and everything yeah. like that. If that we cut this through as the same sort of section, it, it's amazing. Meat is muscle, and the harder the animal works it, the tougher it becomes, and the longer it needs to be cooked to become perfectly tender. We could cook this for six hours. Go to the pub. Go to the pub. Have some okay. wine, sit yeah. down, read your some of the yeah. paper. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let, let's take this little muscle out. Doesn't look like much at the moment, mm -hmm. but when we clean that up, you can see we've got all of those connective absolutely. tissues. Look at that, look at that. Many butchers don't know this bowler muscle exists. Look, all the, the, see the connective tissues here, which will turn to gelatin later. You cook it long and slow, and it'd be to the point that you would just shred mm. it apart mm -hmm. with your fork. Can I have uh, half of it? You can have half of okay, it, yeah. So we've taken the humerus bone out. I mean, the marrow fat itself out of the middle. People are mixing into their burgers. See yeah, it there? Look how beautiful it is. So we're just going to remove this scapula bone here. Now, this is good for spanking Frenchmen's bums. Well, Frenchmen have got some response, OK? Here we are. <laughs> they look like balls. <laughs> let's, let's take this off and we yeah. can expose just a little bit more. So we've got this tiny little fillet of meat that runs through here, which is the scientific name is the Terrace Major. But can you find it in a, in a, in a retailer? No. No. No, you no, no, not unless anyone's doing what I'm doing and using the whole carcass and breaking it down from scratch. Today I'm very happy because actually I have learned, OK, how to cook three pieces of meat which I didn't even know existed. Yeah. OK, so thank you very much, Nelson. Why don't we have a little beer now? We'll have we deserve beer. it, eh? Yeah, we do. We deserve we it, do. OK? Yeah, you've done a lot of work. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. I feel exhausted <laughs> seeing you working. Why have I got a small one and you've got a big one? I'm Australian. Mate. Look at that. You're French, I'm Australian. Look at the way it's on. meant to be. Yeah. <laughs> What's going wrong here? Hey, come on, man. The cheap and tough cuts of meat Nathan has shown Raymond can be tricky to cook well. This next recipe perfectly demonstrates how mastering the art of slow cooking 
can elevate a less popular cut into one of the most impressive meat dishes around. Asian flavored beef shin served with papaya salad. That is the toughest piece of meat you can find. It's full of connective tissues, of collagens, of sinews. You can see that, look, look, look at that. These tough things, okay? And the slow cooking will not only tenderize that piece, but make it a lovely, beautiful eating experience. A bit of oil, going to do a bit of a massage. Just rub it nicely. I feel like a Japanese geisha. Fry the oiled shin for four minutes on each side to brown it. This will add flavor before slow cooking. Voila, there we are. Next, the braising stock. White onions, ginger, red chili, garlic, miso paste, and a sprinkle of five spice. Sometimes the cook has got to wait. So the best way to wait is with a nice glass of Pinot Noir, okay, from Burgundy, of course. But not today. Actually, it looks like an onion soup. You could do a fantastic onion soup here. All these ingredients here, you can see they've caramelized beautifully. Okay, so we're going to add sweet and acidity. Add honey for sweetness, soy sauce for salt, and a splash of rice wine for extra bite. And a lot of water. Five hundred gun. Okay, that's it. Look at that. The beef will be half covered, okay, with a braising stock. So there will be moisture within the pot. The pot will also be covered, yet it will lose half of its liquid. It will take four and a half hours to cook. But I found that 150 degrees is really the perfect temperature to cook these very, very hard muscles. To complement the Asian flavors, the shin is served with a spicy Thai green papaya salad mixed with a zesty dressing. Just toss them very nicely. Toss, yes, toss them nicely. Toss them, toss them. Big difference. So now I'm ready to serve. Oh, mon dieu. Look at that sumptuous, breaking away. But what is interesting, look. No pressure, you just sink into the meat. I'm a very happy cook. Completely melted. You just move the bone, as simply as that. Don't give it to your dog, it will be frustrated. So the breathing stock has become the sauce, and the onions have melted down, caramelized beautifully. Maybe a bit of coriander on the top. Tasting at the end of the day is everything. It's lovely. All the freshness of flavors are there. Here goes the robustness, rusticness of a big dish, big flavors. Perfect. Bon appetit. If you're feeling confident about slow cooking, duck leg confit is a French classic. It's a challenging recipe, but well worth the effort. Confit is an ingredient cooked slowly and gently in fat, so its consistency becomes rich and succulent. A prime example of this technique is duck leg submerged in duck fat served with a white bean stew. I am going to do a recipe which comes from southwest of France, and this dish will go a long way to explain the mystery of slow cooking. Because here, we are going to slow cook in fat, in duck fat. I'm going to show you three techniques. Curing, slow cooking in duck fat, and then the pan frying to give a lovely brown, crispy skin to that duck. The first stage is to lightly cure the duck leg with salt. Well, the salt will penetrate the flesh, will dehydrate it, soak out the moisture, Okay, change completely the texture, change the flavor completely. Then add pepper, garlic, thyme, and bay leaves. Cover to prevent oxidation and leave in the fridge for 12 hours. For the minimum of air here, I want to prevent oxidation. Oxidation is discoloration as well. After the duck legs have been cured, time for stage two, 
gently cooking them in duck fat at 85 degrees. That looks horrible. And some of you might say, oh my God, what is he doing? Is he going to kill us? Oh no, I'm not. I mean, duck fat is probably the very best fat. Duck fat is packed with monounsaturated fat, so a good fat. So I remove most of the herbs and so on here, because we don't need them anymore, they've done their job. And then, so just, voila. Voilà, très bien. And of course, the secret is to cook them slowly, slowly, slowly. It will take about one hour, one hour and a half. Sometimes they're very big. It may take two hours. But what's most important is the temperature. The temperature is here, 115. You put all that coal mass, so the temperature will come down to about 85 degrees. While the duck legs slow cook submerged in the melted fat, Prepare the cocoa bean stew. Roughly chop garlic, add onions, olive oil, and cloves. Just two cloves maximum, two little bay leaves, plenty or large one, one sprig of thyme. Oh, that takes the most beautiful one. Put the beans. Then I cover just with water, barely cover. Voila, perfect. To add a smoky note to the stew. A little bit of piggy, this nice little berry here. Beautiful little dices. Oh. If you want to, you can also put a few black pepper. You can see this one little bubble, very slow cooking. Gently, gently, let that heat come through. Let the exchange of herbs, flavors come through. It will be perfect, trust me. With the bean stew simmering for 50 minutes, two techniques are again combined as the slow cooked duck legs are pan fried to give a crisp caramelized coating. At this point, on the skin side, that's when you're going to give some lovely colors and fantastic texture. My beans are also perfectly cooked. I can see it, but I tell you why? The skin, look, the skin is literally bursting out of the bean. Now's the very best moment. So, yeah. I've got my beautiful beans here. A little bit of jus, that, that jus is absolutely delicious full of the smoky flavors of bacon, the beautiful beans and the herbs. That's shaved parsley. Just sprinkles a little bit of color. So then, my gorgeous duck is here. That is lovely. Okay, let's test. Oh, the crisp. Oh, malaise. <laughs> <laughs> the beauty is slow cooked. It's absolutely beautifully crunchy outside, completely melting inside with flavors, the most as well. That's really the perfect slow cooking. So I'm, I'm eating so too much, too much food. Yeah. The technique of slow cooking is not only reserved for savory dishes, it can make a show-stopping finale to a meal too. It is an innovative approach for cooking fruit, but it is exceptionally effective for varieties of apple, like the Braben or Cox, which will lose their tartness and become deliciously sweet. How to do it is shown in this deceptively simple cooked apple dessert. Now that we actually know about slow cooking, we're going to do something slightly different, delicious, showing really all the mysteries really of slow cooking and how slow cooking can do all sorts of little miracles. So the dish I'm going to do is a compressé of apple. It's simply just apple slices which are cooked for three hours. Of course, food, we all know too well, it's about complicated simplicity. Picking the right apple for this technique is vital. They must be firm. A flowery apple will break down into a mush. Varieties like the Cox and Braeburn are low in sugar and high in the natural gelling agent, pectin, making them the perfect choice for a tureen. I've got eight or ten apples, according to size, OK? But you know, we laugh, okay? but I always think an apple a day keeps the doctor away. But it's very important to get the right thickness. That is the right thickness. It's about one millimeter, one and a half maybe, but not too thin because it will puree and not too thick because it will not stick together. Voilà. 
I cut a bit of greaseproof paper the size of matein, plain melted butter, dash out calvados. Don't put too much, you don't want something too alcoholic, just a little dash to lift the, the flavor. That goes into matein very nicely, a bit of butter calvados. So then uh, sideways. It's like really a builder's job, really. It's very, very simple. You're just building a simple terrain with layers of apples. So it's, uh, basically what is fantastic about it, no sugar, but the apples, their own fructose, OK? The natural pectin in the apple is a jellyfying agent. Very, very simple. When you make jam, that's what you're doing. You add pectin to strengthen the thickness, OK, of the fruit. After slow cooking, the pectin will set the terrine as it cools. So two-step cooking. Well, the first step will be to, to cook the terrain and to lose minimum juice as possible. Très bien. Double wrapping the terrain will stop the juice evaporating. It's all important as it will caramelize the apples as they slow cook. That's a process of slow cooking. We're going to break down the fibers of the apple. The juices are going to come out. Of course, the pectin is also going to break down as well. OK? So you place your terrin on a tray in the middle of the oven, preheated at 180 degrees centigrade. It will take one hour and a half for the first cooking. Then you move ter ter your terrin out, remove the paper, and let the steam go away. Look, the terrain has already lost about one quarter of its volume. The apples are collapsing and they're also browning. I'm going to put it back in the oven for another one hour and a half to finish the cooking, but mostly to let the steam escape. So the apple experience is even stronger. For a professional decoration to accompany the terrain, a perfect apple crisp. I'm becoming a champion at apple slicing, look. Make syrup from 100 grams of water, 50 grams of sugar, and a dash of lemon juice. Pour it over the apples. The syrup will part cook them. Drain, then bake them flat in the oven for 45 minutes for a restaurant-style trimming. After it's three hours in the oven, the terrine needs to be left to cool, allowing the apples to compress further and the pectin to set. That's really wonderful what I see here. Really look how compressed the apples have been. Turn very gently. Place a little cake board right in the middle here. And then turn it around, voila. Look at gorgeous it is already. The slow cooking has melded the individual apple slices into a stunning terrine bursting with flavor. And for a crisp base, Puff pastry cooked between two baking sheets to stop it rising. What you have here is really melting, beautifully scented apples, OK? Over this, this very beautifully textured pastry. Just close. Bit of caramel sauce, just water and sugar. Put in ice cream, homemade. And then, voila, 